Hi, everyone. It, um, we've got to one o'clock. So, uh, Alicia, do you want me to, to crack on? Yeah, go right ahead, Franco. It's 8 a.m. on this side of the world, so let's start. Uh, 8 a.m. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Franco Peel, and um, I'm the Senior Communications Manager at the Partnership for Child Development. Um, today's webinar is being presented by my colleague, uh, Dr. Laura Appleby. Laura is the Neglected Tropical Disease Control Program Manager at um, Partnership for Child Development based at Imperial College London. Um, and for those of you who don't know PCD, um, PCD seeks to improve the educational outcomes of children in low and middle income countries by building the evidence base and strengthening the capacity of governments and their development partners to implement nationally owned school health programs. And Laura, as well as her expertise in all things NTD related, she's also leading a number of programs which are looking to build the uh, research and the programmatic evidence base around integrated school health programs. And now in, in the context, in the context of this discussion today, uh, integration we're looking at is um, using schools as a platform for the delivery of multiple interventions, which are essentially focused on improving the health and education outcomes of school children something which I, uh, I imagine is the focus of most people on this webinar. Now, when done effectively, integrated uh, school health nutrition offers potential benefits both in programmatic and implementation terms, in policy terms, and in health and education outcomes, which I think are all relevant to all four pillars of the FRESH framework. Now, I think I'll, I'll shut up now and hand over to Laura, but could I remind you um, that if you have any questions as we go along, please could you... Um, write them into the comments box on the left-hand side, and then we can discuss them at the end, if that's OK. Um, now, can I just double check? Cause can everyone see the presentation? Um, and if we can, Laura, do you want to take over? Sorry. Sorry. I'm not touching it. I'm just muting myself. <laughs> I can move the slides, slides, slides moving. So over to you. All right. Thanks, Franco. Um, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, as Franco mentioned, I'll be presenting some data from our um, integrated school health program that um, we've been supporting in Ethiopia. Um, we've been working here over the last four years um, to gather information surrounding um, a multi-partner implemented, um, a multi-program um, school health initiative. And um, I hope to show you some data which shows that um, shows changes in indicators with the um, implementation, the um, efficiencies of this integration, um, some of the community perceptions that we've gathered, and, and um, the feedback from government as well, um, as well as um, the cost data um, and in terms of efficiencies of integration. Um, as I'm sure you all are very well aware, schools make a fantastic platform from which to launch health and education initiatives. Uh, this image depicts a diverse array of ways that schools can deliver on health um, and serve as a support to the health sector um, through its strong position within the community. Um, and there's, uh, we've got deworming activities, we've got vision screening, um, activities, there's the um, importance of WASH and the, um, the health education, school feeding, the accessibility of schools, making sure schools are inclusive, um, as well as um, the position here um, towards the communities, but all underpinned by the FRESH framework. Um, so the, um, the Enhanced School Health Initiative, um, acronymed ESHI, takes place, um, it's being conducted in the southern part of Ethiopia um, in uh, SNMPR. Um, and uh, it's a, it is a pilot program within which PCD is support, supporting in terms of collating and analyzing the findings to inform the government, uh, government policies moving forward, to inform their budgeting, to inform action. Um, the first, the, one, of the, one of the primary things that we were supporting um, with here was the actual mapping in order to understand the need and the required level um, for targeting of the program um, at, at both uh, four years ago when the program was initially designed, but also moving forward with, in terms of scale up. 
Um, so as you can see from these, these maps, you, there's a high soil transmitted helminth prevalence, um, and there's a, a, a re relatively low school feeding status. Um, this would be expected as it's quite a poor area, um, relatively food insecure. Um, we gathered wash data for the um, for the region, which um, actually was taken by the government and taken up as part of their national mapping um, for soil transmitted helmets and schistosomiasis. Um, but this is the data just from SNMPR. And you can see that um, in the first map that there is um, a sort of a poor coverage of good water sources. Um, over 50% of schools are actually collecting water from rivers or lakes, open water. Um, the water availability, it's not available year round, um, even in those schools which have piped water sources, um, and especially with rainwater collecting. Um, and there's a high level of open defecation in schools. 43% um, of schools had evidence of open defecation in this area. Um, just to present a bit of the findings of, an, of the national um, analysis, the national uh, mapping that was conducted um, across the whole of Ethiopia as part of this um, and included um, 1,645 schools. Um, this, some of the analysis shows that, that more frequent collection of water for schools is associated with a higher schistosomiasis prevalence. So the, the children who frequently have to go towards um, rivers and lakes and streams um, to collect their water um, for schools, as they were reporting, um, to bring back to school, actually had higher schistosomiasis um, prevalences. Um, better sanitation and best, uh, was associated with a lower Ascaris and hookworm infection, so it's protecting against these um, infections. and better hygienic indicators were associated with less hookworm. Um, and this is all um, research that's been published uh, just earlier this year by um, Jack Grimes et al. in PLOS NTD. So there really is a, a, a link between the WASH um, and the um, WASH and uh, helminth infections in these areas. So going um, back towards um, ESHI, it's um, multi-partner, um, multi-intervention uh, initiative, which consists of school feeding daily, um, an annual deworming, uh, WASH infrastructure, building the infrastructure and providing support to WASH clubs. And as part of this, PCD has been involved in gathering the education around health, nutri nutrition, food security, um, and bringing all, all that together on a platform for research and building the evidence. Um, so ESHI is really build, uh, bringing partners together in a very complex area of school health and nutrition. Um, and this is kind of some of the partners that have been involved. So WFP have been supporting with the school feeding. SMV uh, were involved with um, building the infrastructure around the WASH. Um, SCI and PCD with the deworming. And all of it, um, at the very center of this, it was the, the government um, in the area, the regional bureaus, um, which were supporting in terms of um, coordination, monitoring, evaluation, follow-up, and um, coordinating the steering group meetings um, for the program. Um, another key player that we had was the Ethiopian Public Health Institute, um, who've been um, absolutely critical in um, uh, help, helping with the uh, parasite prevalence surveys, the follow-up surveys, which are uh, quite massive undertakings um, that happen every year. And we've got our last end line coming up in uh, this coming October. So as you can imagine, a fair amount of capacity building has actually been happening in the areas of data collection, um, parasitological techniques, program management. Um, and so we see this all as a positive outcome of um, the overall program. So you can see the school locations here. The, the program, it's a pilot program um, across 30 schools in SNMPR. And um, it, like I say, the, the, um, in, the idea is to really help inform the government with where they want to support um, with school health, how they want to finance that, and what they want in terms of policy moving forward. So it's been going for three years now. Um, and this, so this is the latest data from uh, last summer, 2015. Um, so I've got the co collated data. You can see that there's been a drop in parasite infection intensity um, with, uh, in terms of hookworm and ascaris, which are two um, pretty nasty worm infections. Um, and the, the hookworm, uh, the ascaris in particular, and the hookworm actually, they, they had initial in 2013, very high intensities were being shown in some children. So it's um, the, you can see that year on year that has been decreasing um, with the annual deworming. 
it's not gone yet, however, and that's something um, that perhaps we can return to, but it it's, um, may indicate that we need um, further intensity in terms of uh, distributing drugs. Changes in school enrollment, you can see that enrollment's gone up or stayed the same, um, and this is in the face of um, this is in the face of some political insecurity in some of the schools, uh, particularly in Kokid Gedabano uh, in the uh, the north of the SNMPR. Um, so th this is just going to show you some some of the wash our findings and learnings around the wash. Um, so one of the one of the the um, things that was uh, uncovered by the WASH survey is that 100% of schools in that um, in the, the region were reporting that they had um, WASH infrastructure, that they had school toilets. But as you can see, some of these are not exactly um, very safe, um, and I've seen these, these are not even the worst of them. Some of them, you know, you, you, a small child could fall through the, the hole for the latrine, for example. Um, so the presence of toilets on a survey is very different to um, what is happening in actual fact. Um, as well, what we were finding is that um, even with the newly built infrastructure, and you can see that in the bottom middle picture, um, if these were not being kept clean, there was definitely still evidence of open defecation around the school. So one of the key things is to ensure that um, ensure that schools are supporting cleaners. And, and on the picture on the left, which is a very attractive picture, I hope no one's having lunch just now, um, you can see this is this is a school where they said they were cleaning the toilets, but it was a pupil pupil initiative. Um, so following um, this is our one year follow up. Uh, there was a recommendation that uh, the schools um, looked for financing for cleaners. Um, if, well, in the future, um, and this made a massive change in the in the 2015 survey in terms of identifying and finding clean latrines in the schools and reports from the children that they were using these latrines as well. Um, hand washing facilities was something else that was provided, making sure there were hand washing facilities close to the latrines um, as well as close to where school feeding was happening was very important. Um, so the bottom left picture here you can see um, this is the, the final product of the, the latrines that SMV were building um, and you can see the, the nice sturdy um, reinforced uh, pits that were built on t before the, the infrastructure, the top infrastructure and the slabs went on. Um, so these are, these are um, they're quite robust latrines, they shouldn't, um, they shouldn't cave in, in in the rainy season as well. Um, so it's, it's often, what we're finding is that it's often less about the big money in terms of wash, but it's making sure that what is being provided is clean, it's functional, and it's also strategically located. So having hand washing facilities close to the latrines, having hand washing facilities right where the children are going to be um, getting their food if there's school feeding happening. Um, health education materials, providing these was also um, part of the initiative, and this is just an example of some materials that PCD has produced in the past, but um, just really making sure that it covers um, multiple areas of, um, of school health, and that could be the face washing, um, it could be that, because wash uh, infiltrates across so many different health areas, um, whether, it's, whether it's face washing, whether it's... Um, uh, diarrheal diseases or helminth infections, trachoma, um, and just general nutritional indicators have been shown to be very intrinsically linked to the level of wash and sanitation that's occurring in an area. Um, so some of the findings around the community group discu discussions and, uh, is that um, the perceptions around deworming are generally, uh, well, we're always, as far as we've we found, is that it's good. The community is appreciating the deworming. They're happy with it. Um, and they're, um, they're saying, you know, it helps our children. Um, it lets them eat. It prevents sickness and abdominal pain. Perception, perceptions around school, uh, school feeding coming from the community include um, that the you know, they're, they're, they're happy, the children are getting strong, they're happy. Um, in particular, school feeding is, is viewed even at the community level as a way to create equality within the schools um, and ensure that all the children are getting equal, um, equal access to the nutrients. Um, as well, one of the interesting things we found was that the, the communities are then seeing what's going into these nutritious school meals, taking at home and, um, for example, mixing their cereals so they get um, the v variety of nutrients and the benefits that go with that. Um, and then it's, we've, 
we, we were having reports that it was influencing the, the wash infrastructure was influencing the um, wash at home uh, latrine construction has become a model for the community to learn and build latrines so that they're, they're mimicking and they're, they're copying for instance the reinforced pit um, the activities in the school have become a model for the community um, behavior change around personal hygiene um, so reaching the community through schools can be found and this is uh, you know a key a key advocacy piece for using schools um, schools for health initiatives um, is that the community is really benefiting from this the community is learning to build latrines they're, they're learning from the um, from the children they're learning from the behavioral parts of the program um, and and that is indicating as well that the, you know that they're appreciating this and they see that the benefits will continue into the future. Um, once we've learned to make our clothes clean and wash our hands, why would we stop? The behavioral part of the project will continue. Um, I, have, I have changed my hab hand washing habits and use of the toilet. It is a form of knowledge and habit sharing. Um, and schools as well can be um, therefore a wider platform for health. Um, in terms of washes saving us from medical expenses, the community is benefiting. Um, there's been a decrease in diarrheal diseases overall since the wash has been um, put into the schools. Um, the best change in the community is the student motivation to attend school. Um, and the activities in the school have become a model. Um, so this is really showing you know, that schools, schools are really part of the community. Uh, we interviewed local governments to find um, views and opinions, um, understanding of how the program was um, perceived. Um, and one of the key feedback bits was that it's important to uh, discuss implementation and strategy um, with local offices to avoid duplication, multiple um, latrines, for example, in um, in a, in a school and perhaps no latrines or no no uh, water pipes in another school um, it also is important um, in terms of letting the um, the local bureaus the local offices know where they need to focus efforts in terms of maintenance um, and fund how they they budget for that um, one of we uh, we were hearing that um, schools is okay, it's okay, they can do the latrine building, but the main problem is the, the maintenance, uh, making sure that these uh, these latrines are, are uh, correctly cared for and the pipes are cared for, um, and that's often quite a challenge to the government and to the schools. Um, and ensuring sustainability um, oh, uh, was was perceived as something that's possible. So we were quite we were quite keen to know what's going to happen if the program's a four year program. What will happen once the partners leave, um, and and how will the community and the schools? How do they see this going forward? Um, so the feedback there was that while the approach to assign cleaners is new, it's not difficult. The schools are already assigning cooks. They can pay for a cleaner um, to support that. Um, and communities in, in particular can be mo mobilized to support if they understand why and where the money goes. So again, it's very important to get that community engagement and understanding. Uh, so the um, the costs of the program um, was some of the key findings from this um, and really show this graph is kind of the overall integrated costs um, for the program as a whole. Um, and as you can see, the, the food is really making up the bulk of the, um, the total pie chart. Um, so food is a, a recurring cost um, and the school feeding, as you might imagine, is the most expensive part of the program at $28 per child per year. Um, deworming and wash. Um, seen here, you can see that um, it's uh, a lot cheaper. So even wash uh, is a depreciating cost. So a lot of the costs are in the initial year of building. And because the uh, life expectancy of a latrine may be up to 10 years, um, you can uh, cost that out over a 10-year um, approach and see that it's actually a lot cheaper than the school feeding. Um, something to consider here is that many governments around the world, um, including Ethiopia, are considering scaling up um, and supporting school feeding as part of their pro-poor um, interventions. And it, it's a great advocacy tool to be able to say, well, include, include it, wash infrastructure here, um, or include deworming. It's, it's pennies on the pound um, to be able to integrate this. Um, the, the synergies in terms of um, where the integrated, um, in terms of the integrated program, come within the, the monitoring and the transport for the program, um, and the, sorry, and the training and awareness. Um, uh, so 
uh, the, yeah, the monitoring and evaluation, the transport, the training and awareness programs, um, and that's really where the synergies are, are being found uh, in an integrated program. So you can bring the teachers together and the head, the head teachers, members of the community together for one or all together um, training um, to cover multiple parts uh, and, and multiple elements. Um, another key finding is that the community is actually contributing a fair a fair chunk. Um, of uh, costs, and in this in this case, costs here mean um, they're covering uh, either the salaries of the cooks or the cooks themselves in terms of security, um, in, in terms of firewood materials for construction. So they're not contributing per se uh, money, but it's um, uh, sort of in lieu of money uh, materials. Um, and. I think that's my last bit on this bit. So really, there's there's synergies in terms of the costs, but the most important thing is that there's real synergies in terms of optimizing the effects um, of each uh, of each program, which uh, in in a silo would not have the same effect as it is when they're all combined. So for example, if you're spending money on school feeding, you want to ensure that the maximum number of those nutrients um, is going to the child by making sure that they are parasite free. Um, if, the, if the children are parasite free, you want to ensure that they stay that way by providing um, ways for them to protect themselves through hand washing facilities and through um, uh, provision of latrines as well and, and the education to support the behavior change around that. Where's my... Um, so, so in terms of um, actually implementing implementing this, it's a school health and nutrition, as I'm sure everyone is aware, is a very complex field of partnerships, integrated programs, and policy. And this goes across. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm seeing some questions. Am I going to address those at the end? Okay. Um, yeah. So in terms of. Um, uh, the actual communication and the stakeholders who are involved. Um, and this is just uh, kind of a, a pictorial representation of how I saw it, in particular for WASH, but uh, it goes across um, perhaps all, all the different school health interventions. And that at the top is the government, um, who might have some coordination with the donors, NGOs, and international organizations. Um, and in turn, um, and as well, it filters down specifically to the teachers, PTAs, schools, local educational authorities. Um, and that that is direct, and this um, this pyramid actually goes both ways. So we need to make sure that those channels are clear. Um, and in the terms of ESHI, there were steering groups that were set up, um, which would meet regularly to to consult and to um, coordinate the activities to ensure that each part and each part was being uh, represented and conducted. Um, sort of in a good way and that any feedback that was coming back from the monitoring and evaluation was fed into it. Um, this was particularly important for the school feeding part of the program, which is quite a complex intervention. Um, so in terms of integrating interventions, um, school health does have multiple synergies in terms of costs, delivery, training, and effects. Uh, WASH requires simple, safe, and effective measures in order for it to be um, a successful intervention. Um, and sustainability can be achieved with community involvement and consent. Um, so making sure that this is a program that's really seen as something that can be taken forward um, and the community values. Um, so there are other areas of integration um, that I haven't really spoken about, but it's important to think about. Um, where those integration, where that integration can happen. So it can happen at the school level in terms of different school health interventions, or perhaps it can be linked with other NTD programs um, as, the, as the health sector may be delivering um, certain materials and are certainly involved in deworming in many ways. Uh, and integrating interventions is also linked um, in terms of wider school learning. So the benefits to, to um, enrollment and attendance, for example. There is now. Um, in terms of Ethiopia, as well as globally, there's now increasing interest in using the school as a platform for providing various health and nutrition interventions, um, including deworming, school feeding, and health education. Um, and it, in terms of moving forward with this in Ethiopia, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was a pilot program to inform the government um, so that they can they can understand how they want to move forward with school health, um, where they want to um, invest. So the government is using these costing data to inform their school health and nutrition um, and their educational sector plan in moving forward. Um, they're interested in 
um, in uh, their interest in scaling up ESHI to multiple re regions um, as a way to increase school attendance and uh, benefit the education sector. The maps that were produced have been used to inform um, the Ethiopia's national deworming program, um, and so that's a that's a great result from um, some of this the ESHI work. Um, and the government is also already using the model from the uh, from the school feeding to scale up school feeding to other regions, um, and the different regions. I think, as uh, for those of you who know Ethiopia, Oromia as well as SNMPR have started scaling up and financing their school feeding program um, using internal finances. Um, so now that in Ethiopia the education sector development plan and the school health and nutrition strategy have both been launched, there's an opportunity to link um, the two with the two in terms of the education sector development and school health and nutrition with a government-led approach. And the government is certainly showing um, showing interest in wanting to scale that up. Uh, it's just a slide on what makes integrated school health and nutrition programs work. Um, certainly, high-level political support is important to ensure the long longevity of the study and of, and of a program. Cross-sectoral partnerships is very key because you're using um, expertise across different um, different fields um, and making sure that those partnerships are strong and the communication is happening um, can help also further um, efficientize, make things more efficient as well. Um, Policy plans, M&E frameworks, and budgets are all very important as well, um, and making sure and uh, making sure that these are these feed through all the different layers of education sector planning um, and program planning as well. Ensuring a strong evidence base is important, and that's where those maps are really coming in. So we know that um, what is being targeted is what is needed in an area, um, for example. Um, in ensuring that um, what the government is going to invest in is going to have the effects that they, they are hoping for um, is very important in these resource-poor areas. Community sensitization and public awareness campaigns um, all help the um, help with making sure that it's sustainable it's a sustainable program um, and make sure it's a successful program as well um, and development partner cooperation um, in as well as integrating programs from different spheres so whether you can integrate um, as I mentioned before perhaps with another health program um, or using uh, wash is sometimes not always focused on schools so how can you get the community level wash and the focus um, to include and consider schools when they're building um, when they're building their infrastructure. So bringing it right back um, to the, um, the representation of schools as a platform, um, th there is scope to really see a school which has all these multiple interventions um, and to see them with the, uh, the connections to the community because um, the schools really are part of the community um, as well as a community in themselves. Uh, and just a quick slide, just to say this is an evolving research agenda. At the moment, um, ESHI was looking at um, deworming, school feeding, and WASH. Uh, we're now moving forward into the final year, looking at whether there's scope um, and capacity to include vision screening as an inclusive education uh, uh, intervention onto that platform as well. And... There should be two more slides, but they aren't there. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'll take any questions. Great. Thank you very much for that, Laura. So, so just in sort of summation, do you think that if we could sort of break it down to sort of the benefits that, that ESHI, so sort of the evidence was the sort of from the programmatic side, I it's it's it's, uh, it's easier, cheaper, more effective to to run interventions at the same sort of time, both sort of costing and, and sort of a infrastructure. Um, approach. Then also, the there's health and educational benefits, such as um, linking deworming with school feeding, with um, with water and sanitation, improves the health outcomes and and and, and the knock-on educational impacts of that. And then it seems to be thirdly, there was a uh, the influencing policy or the or the sort of policy environment around it, both from community engagement. But also influencing national policies and regional policies. Um, just looking at some of the questions that are that have been posed, I think I think um, we can take them in groups, and obviously they came up as you were talking through. And um, a number of the questions were looking at the cost data. 
Uh, so Caroline asked, um, does this data include the cost of research in uh, brackets in m and &E? um, Maybe we can also take that at the same time as, um, as a question on cost from Mahini, which said, is it reasonable to say these costs would be lesser without the technical support once these are sustained? Over to you. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. It's um, So the cost data does include the monitoring and the evaluation um, and the annual uh, survey. Uh, not only the annual survey, that's the big survey where we're conducting the, the parasitology and understanding how that how um, things have changed year on year in terms of school attendance, in terms of um, funding from the schools, in terms of um, actual parasite burden. Um, and the children's uh, knowledge, attitudes, and practices. Um, so it does include that annual stuff, and there has also been follow-up monitoring, um, mid-year monitoring um, activities that have happened. And so those costs do include both of those. Um, so Mahini, yeah, you're right. It would it would be less, um, and that's one of the, the things I, I really would have liked to look into more. Um, and we, I think we're beginning to explore is what, what does it cost if you're not doing the annual parasite prevalence survey because. If it's 40 cents per child per year to do the deworming, it's actually a lot less if you're not in actually um, kind of doing the, the parasitology and the, the um, using the technicians and mobilizing technicians at the same time. So yes, it would be a lot cheaper. Great, thank you. And so, so then we move on to questions which, which we're looking at actually the sort of the secretariat and the uh, the structures around the uh, implementation of the program. And can I ask, did the various ministries actually have a common secretariat or another type of constant coordination body that was, that was sustainable without donor support? And actually following on that same sustainability question is, um, how will the partnership infrastructure be maintained going forward? Yeah, very, very good questions. Um, and um, for the first one in terms of secretariat structures, um, it's very much in the initial phases, it was a much smaller, um, smaller local program. Um, so we had the regional bureaus um, and the local warriors involved. Um, and there were steering group meetings, I believe, at the beginning in the initial phases, quite regularly um, drifting down to um, once a month and then once every six months during the program. Um, and. Um, that involves not only the government bodies but also the partners. So that was uh, WFP, SNV, um, and PCD, as well as um, yeah, the local the local government, the teachers. And that that helps with the feedback, with the coordination, um, and with the understanding for how the program is actually actually moving forward. Um, as the program moved on, the, the, the uh, national government became more involved, at least at, you know, as an observer, and were more aware of the program. Um, and so there, there was more information feeding up to national level um, as well. In terms of moving forward, I think that's something that's been um, of quite concern to us over the last um, you know, 18 months or so, and is something that we hope to we, we have begun addressing. Um, and we hope to really finalize that as uh, this in this final visit in October um, and to make sure that those those bodies are quite robust and we believe that in SNMPR uh, we have quite a good steering committee that there's people at the government level who are very committed to this program um, and they can see the benefits and that's really helped in terms of getting that engagement and making sure there's that sustainability um, and I, I think one of the things that the government's quite keen to do um, is to look into actually building a similar sort of structures around the country as well um, if they, as they go forward with their school health and nutrition program. Great. The, then we, um, some later questions look at the actual growth of the program. So, so actually taking it, like, uh, taking it beyond ESHI is how, um, Doug has, have have donor organisations responded well to this? Um, and if so, are there other plans to for the um, the model to be adopted by other countries? Is a question that Jennifer was, was asking. And actually, I can see this is also going to tie in. Sorry, I'm going to lump the all three all three many questions together because I, I think I know what your answer might be. Uh, is Eric asks, uh, are there any special provisions for children with disabilities to ensure access to those uh, to these services? Uh, what about eye health? No, I think there might be a program you might want to talk about here. Um, yeah, so um, in terms of um, 
I don't know which, which order to... No, no, I'm just wondering which order to um, address these in. I'll just go in, in order and apologies if I end up repeating myself, but um, donor organisations have generally responded well. Um, I won't lie and say it was without its challenges, um, but I think it's um, a really, you know, at the end of it, at the end of four years, I think uh, each one of the partners who are involved in this really see this as a productive programme and a good way to move forward um, can, as long as the, the right structures are in place. Um, yeah, um, and, and I and I do believe that as you know, in a lot of the countries that um, perhaps international organisations are working in, the governments are becoming um, they are getting greater and greater capacity as well as greater and greater um, national budgets. So it's important to um, consider their abilities and what they want in terms of getting this as a government-led program. Um, and I think as the um, as the international community is adapting to that, that they'll see this as a good way forward as well. Um, in terms of other countries, um, there, there is examples of integrated school health in other countries. Um, we were just chatting this morning about the program in Nigeria where school feeding um, is being scaled out on a, on a national level, rolled out on a national level, and um, they're, they're very keen to include deworming as part of this, as part of the synergistic um, kind of benefits to school feeding to make sure that, that, that that's fully um, envisioned. In terms of special provisions, that's also a very good question. Um, and we're actually sitting on the slide where we, we talked about vision screening. Um, but it's, it is very key, and so we're happy to say that we are partnering with Sight Savers um, in looking at how to make these programs more inclusive. We've started with um, vision screening, knowing that that helps out-of-school children or children who are perhaps not as well engaged with education to become better engaged. Um, and Ethiopia certainly has um, quite a few, actually, programs to really try and start to address this kind of um, issue. Um, but it's a, it is very it is a very important fact, and um, I should I should mention at this point that on the deworming day for the school, the children are all encouraged to bring um, brothers, sisters, cousins, friends, uh, people who are not enrolled in school to receive that. Um, because of course, if you're building everything from a school-based platform, you have to understand that perhaps the most vulnerable children are not actually at school. Great, thanks for that. Um, there's a, a question from Mahini ask, uh, who's asking, with tensions between communities and governments, especially in uh, Oromia, uh, where schools have been non-functional in the last academic year, what are your recommendations to address the bottleneck of getting kids back into school so they can learn and also benefit from SHN? Um, I think my suggestion, well, I mean, in a lot of these areas, and as you can see from some of those community focus group discussions, you know, education is valued um, and school health is valued. Um, you know, if you're providing deworming, if you're providing these interventions and it's clear that that's working well, um, I think the community will be very keen to see their children in schools um, despite, um, you know, these reasonable um, unrest, um, not to say extreme unrest because that completely changes the, the vision for a lot of school health. Um, School feeding is definitely a great way to ensure that children are coming to schools um, and um, you know the the enrollment um, I showed the overall the overall enrollment and that did show that even in uh, Coco Gedavano which actually uh, borders Oromia um, there was the 2014 we couldn't actually visit those schools uh, so we went back last year and you can see that the en enrollment was minimally affected by that unrest which was great to see. Um, and, a, and a lot of the, um, in speaking to their directors, a lot of that is contributed to the school feeding element. Providing one nutritious school for school meal a day um, is definitely valued by communities. Great, thanks. Um, can I just ask a quick question? And you may have answered this earlier, so apologies uh, if you have. What, what are your hopes for the sustainability of this of this particular program? I know I know it's been adopted by various policies and programs at national level, but at sort of regional level and the regional government, once you pull out, what happens? No, that's that's a great that's a great point and something that I think has um, been 
quite high on our minds. So last October we went and we, that's where the, um, the government consultations really came into their own, um, understanding what the government needs, what the school directors need, um, and what the communities need in order to ensure that this is a sustainable program and not just something that becomes another skeleton set of latrines and pipes um, that aren't going to be maintained. Um, and so ensuring that the, I think ensuring that the local government knows where the wash facilities are, so they know where to where they have to go and make sure that pipes are maintained, that water supplies are maintained, that latrines are are checked for for safety. Um, in particular, Ethiopia is recently or is about to launch, I, I believe, school wash guidelines the minimum requirements. Um, uh, in addition to that, um, making sure that the, the, I mean, the school feeding is quite a challenge, I'll be honest, because it is quite expensive. Um, we were addressing that, and there's, there's thoughts that schools do have their own school gardens, um, increasing their, their finances through the selling the, the, the food to the cooperatives um, and building that into the school feeding program as an option. Um, in terms of the deworming, um, that's very much um, sort of a Ministry of Health funded initiative. They've got funding for that. Um, but we're working on a sustainability consultation right now, um, and we hope to present those results to the schools in terms of what can the schools do to ensure this continues um, to the local governments as well as to the national government as well. I'll be presenting the evidence of the impact of the program? Or? It will be presenting the evidence of the impact but also suggesting ways that, the, that this type of a program can be moved forward and continue um, beyond just the four-year partner involvement. Um, at the moment, as you can imagine, the wash infrastructure was built in the first year, it's now the fourth year, so it's just a matter of maintenance for the next nine, ten years, um, and they've been built so that you can actually empty the latrines and the material in the latrines. Whether, you know, the truck can get to those schools is another question, there's one or two that they might not be able to, um, unless the roads improve, um, but that, that's been part of that, um, that infrastructure design as well. So we do, we do hope the whole thing will go forward. Um, you know, and not just kind of leave the leave the communities and the schools kind of with four years of a great a great program and then nothing. Me he has a question: of, um, What's the level of local NGO uh, engagement, or their role? Is there a role that they can play to to help the sustainability of SHN in Ethiopia? Uh, that's actually a very good point. Um, the in terms of the wash component, I believe there was a local NGO that was involved with um, contracting uh, builders as well as developing some of the materials, um, and they're, they're specific to that region, so they, they are involved in these stakeholder groups and in moving forward. Um, I'd, unfortunately, I don't know what their plans are specifically per se, but they are aware of this program. Um, and it might be a very good idea to um, involve more of these local NGOs um, and the communities as well. Sorry, I was on mute then. Um, Carol asked, in terms of the, the food itself, um, how was that produced? Where, where did that come from? Was it externally? Oh, sorry, was it externally produced, or was it, or was it homegrown? Was it local? Yeah, so sorry. I think I, I brushed over that bit. This was a homegrown school feeding program. So as part of this, um, the local cooperatives were set up um, in consultations with the local farmers um, to make sure that the food was all sort of locally produced. Um, the, the chefs were all um, local to the uh, to the area. Um, yeah, locally trained as well. Um, yeah, so it was a, a locally sourced food model. Franco, I think you might be on mute again. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I was, I was. <laughs> sorry. My, my <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. No. Uh, my question actually was to everyone is were there, were there any other questions that, that people wanted to, to ask or uh, actually or put into Laura, was there any final comment that, that she would like to make sort of in summation about the, the impact or the effect or, or other suggestions that, that you might make? I'm sorry, I'm throwing loads of stuff at you here, Laura. Are there any other suggestions that you'd make to other, country, other organizations who are looking to develop integrated SHN programs? 
Um, I mean, in summation, I think actually, Franco, you did a really good job of that, better than I did, um, in terms of how integrated school health can actually have um, a multitude of benefits across informing policy and community engagement, um, benefits to community, educational benefits, um, and benefits in terms of costs and the synergies there. Um, I, in terms of recommendations, I really, I really would suggest that. Um, you know, I think the strengths of this program are the, are the partner involvement and the steering and coordination commit, uh, committees. Um, in a lot of these schools, we lucked out, and the school directors were so engaged and so involved in the program. Um, so that's that's. You know, to me, I think that comes as a recommendation to educational sectors to really try and um, encourage that level of ownership for the school directors and the head teachers towards their schools. Um, my only, my only final thing, I, I don't know how much time, have, but I'd be quite interested to know about um, whether other people on the call have got some similar experiences, um, whether they've got ideas and suggestions as well. Uh, Franco, it's uh, Doug McCall, if I could just jump It was really an elaboration on the question of the response from the, the donor organizations, the funders, um, their response, and, and um, is it working towards trying to influence their decision making, not only the, the funders for this particular project, but others. Um, in your discussions, have you looked at trying to persuade the funders who, who have to have a a program with results as part of their funding. That's part of the demands that are made of them. But can we sort of look to the future of trying to include a kind of a, a slice of the resources going towards coordination and partnerships, um, much the way that many criteria for funding also include a, a requirement for evaluation and monitoring. So is there a, a, is that part of your discussion with the donor, for, donor organizations in this particular project? Um, and could it be something we work on in the future? Um, yeah, hi, Doug. Sorry, that, yeah, no, um, thanks for elaborating on that question as well. And I think I should probably have mentioned, and I hope we don't have a representation from our donor organization here, but it was um, funded by Dubai Cares, um, and they were interested in the education. They're very education focused. So, as far as integrating um, school health, it is interesting because I do feel like that the donors who are most interested in this are education sector donors. Um, the new program that we've got coming up, where we're in, whereby we're integrating vision screening with um, deworming. Um, that's funded by the Global P Partnership for Education um, and the World Bank. So there are people who are interested in these, these integrating, bringing people together um, across um, across these these spheres. And I think that's actually a very good point. Um, you know, it, is, it does become quite challenging when you're when you're trying to say, yeah, we want to have this many children dewormed, but you're not actually looking at the bigger outcome of how can we support the government to do this program themselves, and how can they themselves then harness um, the other resources they need to make sure that deworming program is effective in terms of making sure there's WASH that is part of that, or you know, making sure that WFP can support their activities because they they are often um, you know distributing food and materials to parts of the country. Um, and actually, I think advocating to say part of this funding, having part of that, and and it can go towards setting up and strengthening existing or new um, steering committees that involve these people. That Different levels of, of implementation um, would be, you know, a really great and key activity. Dubai Cares did fund that, and they funded several of the steering group meetings as well. Um, and it's not a lot of money, um, but it was there in the budget, and I think that really helped make this program a success. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, in summation. Uh, one of the earlier comments at the beginning was, are we going to share the, can we share the um, presentation? And we'll certainly be um, posting, that, posting that up along with the recording of the um, webinar. And also, you mentioned a number of documents, and, and we'd be happy to, to share those around, including the, uh, the costing reports and some of the uh, integrated school health manuals. Um, and actually, the school health manuals for teachers, and, the, and there's a school health, there's an integrated school health manual for uh, health workers, isn't there? And extensions. So, yeah, we'll share those around. Um, if there are no further questions, can I just say um, thanks very much for 
Laura for, for providing us this, this, uh, this talk. Um, and can I say that the next webinar is on the 15th of August, uh, and that is by Dr. Rachel Pullen, who's from the, from the Global Atlas for Helminth Infections at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And what she's going to be talking about is, uh, well, the topic is mapping this wormy world, which is a um, talking about how uh, how uh, development of prevalence maps for NTDs, inc uh, including uh, schisto, LF lymphatic filariasis, and uh, STH, um, and how and how program makers can use these maps and these sort of prevalence data to de design targeted and really effective uh, control programs, which is particularly significant given the amount of money that has now been pushed into the control and the ultimately the aim of elimination of, of, of a number of these diseases by 2020. So I think that's that really. Um, and is there anything else you'd like me to mention? No, that's it, Franco. I think if there are no other questions, uh, we can end. Great. Well, th thank you all. Yeah, thank you too. Thanks, Franco, for sharing that too. <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.